Hello and welcome to today's webinar. On behalf of Drug Target Review and Eurofins Discovery, I'd like to thank you all for attending. I'm your moderator, Victoria Rees, Deputy Editor of Drug Target Review. Today's speaker will be Ksenia Cohen Katzen Nelson, PhD, Group Leader, San Diego R&D at Eurofins Discovery. Following her presentation, we'll move on to a live question and answer session where you can pose questions to today's speaker. Please remember, you can submit questions at any point during the webinar using the questions panel situated in the menu on the right. So without hesitation, may I pass over to today's keynote speaker, Ksenia Cohen Katzenelson. Thank you so much for the introduction. So today we'll tell you about the recent paradigm shift in the drug discovery world, which focuses on targeted protein degradation and how you can discover new small molecule degrader drugs using our E3 scan technology platform. The agenda for today will start with an introduction about targeted protein degradation and overview of Eurofins discovery services and products in this space. Then I will dive into the E3 scan technology and assay validation. After that, I will talk more about the biochemical assays that we offer to complement the ESRI scan platform, and I will end up with our screening capabilities and how the ESRI scan can be utilized for these purposes. I will be happy to answer any questions at the end. I would like to start by mentioning that I am part of Eurofins Discovery, that it's part of a big group of laboratories, all under Eurofins Scientific. Eurofins Scientific is providing a range of analytical testing services to pharma, biotech, food, environment, and consumer product industries and governments in the entire world. Me and my team are located in San Diego, California, and our site's main expertise is in screening services using cell-based and biochemical assays. I would like to start with a brief introduction about the ubiquitin proteasome system, which has a major role in targeted protein degradation and our assays. As most of you know, the ubiquitin proteasome system is an important player in cellular homeostasis. It is responsible for the protein quality control in the cell by recognizing and rapidly degrading incorrectly folded or assembled proteins and for regulating diverse cellular processes through the dynamic protein turnover. It has a sophisticated network of enzymes that targets proteins for degradation. The core degradation machine of this system is the 26S proteasome and the label that targets proteins for degradation is the covalent transfer of ubiquitin molecule to substrate proteins and is mediated by three types of enzymes. The E1 is a ubiquitin activating enzyme. This transfers the ubiquitin molecule to the E2 ubiquitin conjugating enzyme. This in turn interacts with a substrate specific E3 ubiquitin ligase enzyme which puts the ubiquitin molecule on a lysine residue of a substrate protein. The accumulation of polyubiquitin chains on a substrate protein targets it for 26S proteasome-mediated degradation. What's interesting is that the human genome contains two genes encoding E1 enzymes, 41 genes encoding for E2 enzymes, and more than 600 genes encoding E3 enzymes. This demonstrates how substrate specificity is achieved in this pathway, mainly through the E3 ubiquitin enzymes. A Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded in 2004 to three researchers who discovered this pathway, Aaron Chehanover and Avram Hershko from the Technion Israel Institute of Technology, and Irwin Rose from UC Irvine. However, this pathway has never gotten the amount of attention it is getting now in the drug discovery world. Major attention to the ubiquitin proteasome and targeted protein degradation came from the thalidomide story. I'm sure some of you are familiar with it by the story of thalidomide, but I still wanted to mention it and explain how important this finding is for the targeted protein degradation in drug discovery. 
Thalidomide was first marketed in 1957 in West Germany under the trade name Contergan. It was primarily prescribed to treat nausea and morning sickness in pregnant women. However, shortly after the drug was sold, 5,000 to 7,000 infants were born with phocomelia, which is malformation of the limbs. Only 40% of these children survive. Throughout the world, more than 10,000 cases were reported of phocomelia due to thalidomide. And finally, in 1959, thalidomide ceased to be provided over the counter. Only by the end of 1961, it was completely taken off the market due to massive pressure from the press and the public. In 2006, thalidomide made a comeback as a combination drug for the treatment of multiple myeloma. This was thanks to the work from Celgin and other companies. And still, during that time, the precise mechanism of action was not known, even with over 2,000 research publications about thalidomide. Only in 2012, studies started to emerge showing that thalidomide's target is the ubiquitin ligase cerebellum. And now it is well accepted that thalidomide is repurposing the specificity of the E3 ligase cerebellum to its target proteins. This finding and others led to now a very popular approach in drug discovery. Can we make more drugs like thalidomide that will retarget the specificity of an E3 ligase to a target of interest and degrade it? The potential of this approach is huge. This means we can now target previously thought undruggable proteins, such as transcription factors, scaffold proteins, and other non-enzymatic proteins, which are 80% of the human proteome. So thanks to the discovery of the mechanism of action of thalidomide and the introduction of the first degrader molecule called PROTAC, which was about 20 years ago, the targeted protein degradation, or TPD term, was adopted in drug discovery world. TPD is the use of small molecules to hijack the cellular degradation machinery by recruiting E3 ubiquitin ligase to proteins of interest to induce their ubiquitin-dependent degradation. There are two types of small molecule degraders that are currently used in TPD. A molecule called PROTAC, which is a proteolysis target and chimera, for specific targeting of an E3 ligase to a target of choice. The product technology was first described back in 2001 by Kathleen Sakamoto, Fred Cruz, and Ray Deshais. It is a chimeric molecule comprising of a ligand for an E3 ligase connected through a linker to a ligand for a target protein. This can bring together an E3 ligase and target protein to close proximity, enabling ubiquitination of the target protein by the E3 ligase and eventually degradation by the protosome. We can also use a molecular glue type of compound, which like its name suggests, glutes together an E3 ligase and a non-native target protein to close proximity together. In this case, the outcome is the same. The target protein is marked for degradation by the proteosome. Targeted protein degradation holds a great promise as compared to small molecule inhibitor drugs. The main reason to use degraders versus inhibitors is to target undruggable proteins such as transcription factors, scaffold proteins, and non-enzymatic proteins. To develop an inhibitor drug, usually the active site of a target will be used for binding to the inhibitor versus degraders don't need an active site. They can bind to any site on the target protein. Degraders can be tissue specific by choosing an E3 ligase that is specifically expressed in a certain tissue. This is much harder to achieve with a small molecule inhibitor. Degraders can have substoichiometric potencies for their target proteins, which is very difficult to get with a small molecule inhibitor. And degraders are designed to be very specific towards their targets, especially thanks to the fact that they can bind to any domain on the target.
therefore are less likely to have off-target effects. Uh, this is compared to small molecule inhibitors because these are targeting an active site which can be similar to other proteins and therefore can have off-target effects. So if we look at the current state of degraders in the clinics, the majority of degraders that are in clinical trials right now recruit mostly cerebellum and VHL E3 ubiquitin ligases to ubiquitinate a protein of interest. This is about 1% of the entire E3 ligase family in humans. So even with everything we learned in the past 20 years since the introduction of the first product degrader, still the degrader discovery and optimization remains an empirical slow process. Recent studies suggest that varying the recruited E3 ligase can influence the degradation of the target space. So if we build more tools to discover novel degraders using novel E3 ligases, the degradable target space can be significantly expanded. To accelerate the TPD field, we are expanding the toolbox by developing additional E3 ligase target assays. Today, we'll show you assays for E3 ligases that have not been utilized in TPD yet, with no known published ligand small molecule, and demonstrate the capabilities of the E3 scan platform to screen for substrate selectivity among different E3 ligases. Here at Eurofins Discovery, we offer a variety of services and products for TPD drug discovery space. To detect binding to E3 ligases and target proteins for degradation, we offer biochemical assays, which are the focus of this webinar. We also offer cell-based assays to assess target degradation in cells or engagement, and phenotypic profiling. And in addition, we offer chemistry beyond the rule of five. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time today to cover these services, but if you are interested in more details, please reach out to me directly and I can connect you with the right person. And now I will tell you more about the E3 Scan platform. E3 Scan is based on a previously established Kinome Scan technology, which utilizes substrate recruitment site directed competition binding assay. Using the Kinome Scan technology, we have developed in the past almost 500 different assays for kinases. We later applied this technology to develop BromoScan and BCL2 scan platforms. And using the same technology, we now developed E3 scan platform with assays for 12 different E3 ligase targets and also assays for individual substrate recognition domains. This platform is going through constant development and more assays will be launched later this year. The E3 scan assay principle is described here. The E3 scan is very similar to the Kinome scan technology and has three key components in the assay. You can see in panel A, the first component is an E3 ligase that has a DNA tag on it and is expressed using our proprietary mammalian or phage display expression systems. This is not a purified protein, but a protein extract, which makes it very easy and fast to make and scalable. The concentration of the protein in our assay is very low at picomolar range, and this allows us to measure broad dynamic range of binding affinities, even at picomolar KDs. The second component is an E3 ligase ligand that is immobilized on a solid support bead. This could be either a small molecule or a peptide ligand. The third component is a test compound or a solvent control. The three components are incubated together to reach equilibrium, then the beads are washed and eluted. The elution is then used for an ultra-sensitive qPCR readout. In panel A, in the absence of a test compound, the E3 ligase will bind to its ligand on the beads. The wells are then washed to get rid of any unbound material and eluded and the signal of the E3 ligase is detected through a qPCR. So in this case, the signal will be high. In panel B, 
in the presence of a test compound that can bind to the E3 ligase, it will compete it off the ligand on the beads, and this complex will be washed off during the washes step. Therefore, there will be no E3 ligase diluted in the assay, and therefore the QPCR signal will be low. In panel C, if the test compound does not bind to the E3 ligase, it will remain bound to the bead and eluded during the elution step. Then the QPCR signal will be high, just like in panel A. So we are looking for a loss of signal in the assay. To produce the E3 ligases for the E3 scan technology, we can use two different methods. In both methods, the human E3 ligases are labeled using a qPCR amplicon for signal detection. They are then expressed using two systems. One is the T7 phage display system. In this case, the E3 ligase is cloned into the T7 phage genome and displayed on the phage code. The qPCR detection amplicon is cloned in the phage genome. The other system is mammalian HEC293 cells. In this case, the E3 ligase is N-terminally fused to the DNA binding domain of NF-kappa B and transiently expressed in 293 HEC cells. The qPCR detection amplicon then uh, binds to the NF-kappa B DNA binding domain is added to the reaction. The 600 human E3 ligases can be classified to two main types based on the core protein domain that facilitates the transfer of the ubiquitin to its substrate proteins. These are the HECT and the RING uh, domain families. Some E3 ligases function as part of a complex and some function individually. The additional subunits that may be part of the complex can include adapters, scaffolds, and substrate receptors. As a proof of concept, we wanted to develop assays against E3 legacies that were most commonly used in TPD, which covers most of these different classes. In addition, we have now also developed assays against E3 legacies that were not used in TPD yet. This offers additional tools for the greater molecule discovery. I will now show you the different uh, assays uh, for E3 scan that we have developed. Here are shown assays against MDM2 and MDMX. MDM2 is a very well established E3 ligase that is known to degrade the tumor suppressor P53. MDMX, on the other hand, does not known to exhibit an E3 ligase activity of its own. However, the two can form a complex together, making MDM2 a more potent E3 ligase. And therefore, we chose to develop assays for both of these, MDM2 and MDMX. MDM2 is also considered to be simple E3 ligase, which means that it does not need other partner proteins to be active. So we cloned full-length MDM2 and MDMX and expressed them using our mammalian expression system. Here you can see data for the control ligands. For MDM2, idazanutlin and nutlin 3 a give comparable KDs to literature values that were measured by other techniques. nutlin 3 b acts as a negative control, just as expected. For MDMX, we used peptides to build and test the assay, also based on a literature publication. As you can see, both of these assays are robust with windows of more than 50 fold. Additional validation of these assays was possible thanks to a collaboration with Ileron Therapeutics. Ileron has a first-in-class clinical stage dual inhibitor for MDM2 and MDMX. The drug was developed to protect healthy cells during chemotherapy while destroying cancer cells. We got to screen a multitude of Ileron staple peptides against MDM2 and MDMX E3 scan assays, including a proof-of-concept staple peptides ATSP7041, on which data was published earlier in 2013 in the Journal of PNAS. The staple peptides can bind both to MDM2 and MDMX with different affinities, 
and the very potent KDs can be detected using our E3 scan assays. In addition, the binding data that we measured for ATSP7041 using our assays is comparable to the BIA core data that was published in that journal. Here is shown assay for VHL, which is a complex E3 ligase. It requires partner proteins in a complex to be active as an E3 ubiquitin ligase. For this assay, we have cloned the full length VHL fused to its partner proteins elongings B and C based on this published crystal structure. We validated the assay against published positive and negative control ligands. And the KD values measured in each scan match the data in the literature that was obtained using FP and ITC methods. The assay window for the positive control ligand is very robust, more than 800 fold. And therefore, this assay, we can also use it for primary screen. Here is shown an assay for another complex E3 ligase, Cerebron. For this E3 ligase, we made two versions of the assay. One is a full-length Cerebron, and the other one is full-length Cerebron co-expressed with its partner protein, DDB1. We validated both versions of the assay against three molecular glue molecules, lenalidomide, pomalidomide, and thalidomide. The KDs measured for these molecules in our E3 scan assays were more potent than the ones that were uh, reported in the literature using an FP assay. Since in E3 scan we are using very low picomolar concentration of cerebellum, we are not hitting a tight binding limit as might happen in FP assay, and therefore able to measure more potent KDs. We also measured binding affinities of cerebellum to commercially available products and their matching negative controls in both versions of the assay. As you can see in this table, there was no significant difference in the KDs uh, between whether we are using Cerebellum alone or Cerebellum co-expressed with DDB1. And therefore, we do not think that DDB1 is necessary for measuring binding affinities to the graders. But both versions of these assays are commercially available. Here are shown assays against three beer domain E3 ligases, CIP1, CIP2, and XIP. These E3 ligases are considered simple, and each of them has three conserved beer domains that are required for substrate selectivity. Initially, we have developed assays against the full length version of each of these proteins. But since the beer domains confer substrate specificity to the E3 ligase, we decided to build assays also for the individual beer domains to be able to find more selective ligands for each domain. We tested four different commercially available ligands for the beer domains and full-length proteins. This is a very busy table summarizing the data we obtained. The main thing to notice in this table is that these two molecules show selectivity towards beer domain three and not beer domain two. Where it says these two molecules show no selectivity towards uh, beer two or three domain. They can bind both very potently. So overall, we see that E3 scan assays for individual beer domains can detect ligand selectivity. Unfortunately, for beer domain one, we are still not able to develop an assay. This domain has a different structure than beer domains two and three and does not bind the same ligands. We are currently in the process to develop an assay with specific capture ligand for this domain. For the next group of assays, we chose the subfamily of HECNET4 E3 ligases. This subfamily has nine members, all involved in the proteasome degradation system, and therefore can be a potential tool in the greater design. 
the entire subfamily shares similar protein domain structure and activity mechanism, whereby this E3 legacies recognize their substrates through their conserved WW domains and then label them with a ubiquitin molecule using their HEC domain, which marks the substrate for degradation. The WW domains like to bind a PPXY motif in its protein substrate, and each of the E3 ligases in the subfamily has its own set of specific substrates that it likes to target for degradation. We took advantage of the PPXY motif to build a panel of selective E3 scan assays for the subfamily using peptides as ligand baits that contain PPXY motif in them. Here is shown a schematic representation of the different HECnet 4 E3 ligase constru constructs used to develop E3 scan assays against them. We have fully developed five of them, and another four are currently in development. For some assays, we use full length construct, and for some, only representative WW domains that bind to the substrate. This table summarizes the results from screening different PPXY motif peptides that were derived from different substrates of the HECnet4 E3 ligases against five different targets, NET4, each, WWP1, WWP2, and SMARF2. This is a very busy table, and what I want you to get from it is the main idea that E3 scan assays that we developed for these five different targets are selective and show a wide dynamic range of binding affinities to different substrates. To better understand this idea, I would like to focus on a few examples from this table. The first one is the each peptide which, as its name suggests, was derived from a substrate of each called TXNIP. The each peptide contains two PPXY motifs and, as expected, showed potent binding to the Israeligus each with a KD of 18 nanomolar. In addition, two other E3 ligases in the subfamily, NED4 and WWP1, show strong binding to the substrate peptide. The other two E3 ligases that we tested, WWP2 and SMARF2, show much less potent binding to the each substrate. This suggests selectivity among these five ligases for the each substrate peptide. Another substrate peptide that we tried was from a substrate of NED4 called ARRDC3. Interestingly, this peptide with just one PPXY motif in it did not show binding to any of the five E3 ligases that we measured. However, the same peptide with two PPXY motifs in it showed much more potent binding to some of the targets. As you can see here, the E3 ligase NET4 binds potently to its substrate peptide with a KD of 134 nanomolar. In addition, E3 ligases each and WWP1 show potent binding to, its, to the substrate as well. WWP2 and SMARF2 show low binding to the substrate. This suggests some similarity in the substrate selectivity among NET4, each, and WWP1, similar to what we have seen with the substrate of each. The next set of substrate peptides that we tested are called WBP1 and 2A and are derived from a YAP ligand and have been shown to bind the WW domain of YAP as well as WW domains of E3 ligases. However, in our assays, we did not see strong binding of these substrates to our E3 ligases. However, not all the substrate peptides that we tested show similar selectivity. For example, SMAD7 peptide is derived from the adapter protein of SMARF2. Here we saw different selectivity towards the substrate. Indeed, SMARF2 itself shows the strongest and most potent binding to its substrate peptide of SMAD7, with a KD of 244 nanomolar. Each and WWP1 showed some binding, but to much lower potency. 
in WWP2 and NED4 show very weak binding to SMAD7. This again suggests selectivity among the different E3 ligases for different substrates, even though they all contain PPXY motif. And our E3 scan assays are able to detect this selectivity. In summary, we have developed and validated E3 scan assays against a variety of different types of E3 ligases, both ring domain and hack domain types, simple and complex. The assays I have shown you are robust and high throughput. The assays that we developed for the HackNet4 subfamily and the individual beer domains are able to measure selective ligand binding among E3 ligases with similar mechanism of substrate recognition. And therefore, these assays can be used as tools to build selective degraders using different E3 ligases. As I have mentioned before, we are continuing to expand our E3 scan platform and developing additional E3 scan assays for other E3 ligases. And as I have shown you for our assay development, we need a ligand, but we are not limited to a small molecule ligand. We can also use peptides. I would like to emphasize the advantages of the E3 scan platform. First of all, quality of data. As you could see from the different assays that I have showed you today, the assays are accurate, precise, and reproducible. They have a broad sensitivity and dynamic range as measured from picomolar to micromolar binding affinities across the entire Israel Igas family. We show good reference compounds data. And another advantage is that all the assays are run in parallel on a single platform, and it's the biggest Israel Igas platform. The second advantage is the quantity. These assays are high throughput and run in 384 well place. They are suitable for library profiling or just weekly SAR screenings. Another advantage is the flexibility. We can do custom assay development and I will touch base about this process in a bit. Last but not least uh, is the speed. The turnaround time for weekly SAR submissions is five days and for bigger screen campaigns is 20 days. So the E3 scan is good for measuring binding to an E3 ligase. And if we want to measure binding to a target protein that we want to degrade, we can use other biochemical assays using the same technology. These three platforms utilize the same technology as E3 scan. Using the kinom scan, we can measure binding to 489 different kinases, pseudokinases, and clinically relevant mutants. Using the bromo scan, we can measure binding to 40 different bromo domain proteins, which is about 60% of the entire family. Using the BCL2 scan, we can measure binding to all five family members. Similarly to E3 scan, we offer custom assay development for additional targets that are currently not in the commercial portfolio. All of these assays can measure ligand potency and selectivity by screening through the entire platform, which enables reliable inter-assay comparison and ability to rank order compounds. For the kinases, we also measure ligand binding mode and kinetics. And all of these assays are suitable as well for library screening. I would like to end with this flow chart demonstrating how a typical E3 scan would look like for a custom assay development project followed by a screening campaign. In case the screening is done on a pre-existing assay, the first three steps are not necessary. So in the case of a custom assay development, we start with cloning of the target and synthesis of immobilized affinity ligand. After that, establishment of a proof of concept and then optimization of assay conditions. These three steps could take about six to eight weeks depending on the target and the ligand. After that, an HDS is performed. This could be a customer's library or one of our libraries that we have between 50,000 to 500,000 compounds. The hits are followed up for confirmation and determination of potency by running full dose response curves. 
This process can take about two to three weeks, depending on the size of the library. So in summary, Eurofins Discovery TPD portfolio includes a comprehensive suite of target-based, cellular, and phenotypic approaches to discover and develop prioritized TPD candidates with high therapeutic potential. I have shown you today the E3 scan platform with which you can identify and characterize new potent and selective ligands that bind and reprogram E3 ligand substrate specificity for TPD. I have also showed you how the Kynum scan, Bromo scan, and BCL2 scan platforms can be used to develop and characterize the warhead end of a novel protein. So with that, I would like to thank you so much for attending my webinar today, and I will be happy to answer any questions. You can also visit our website or contact me directly through my email provided here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ksenia, for your excellent presentation. We now have the pleasure to introduce our question and answer session, where today's speaker will answer all of your questions. Don't forget, you can still submit your questions using the questions panel in the menu on the right. So let's take a look at the first question. So, Ksenia, um, can the E3 scan assay detect compounds that bind to another domain on the E3 ligase uh, rather than the one that binds the capture ligand on the bead? Thank you. This is a very good question. So, our assays will detect binding of any compound that disrupts the ability of the E3 ligase to bind to the capture ligand. And yes, theoretically, if the compound bound to another site but disrupted the ability of the E3 ligase to bind to the capture ligand, it would appear as a hit in our screen. Great, thank you. Uh, so next question now. For the E3 scan, does the KD of the test compound, or sorry, is the KD of the test compound dependent on the affinity of the capture ligand to its E3 target? Thank you, very good question. Um, during the development stages of all of our assays, we optimized the capture ligand density on our solid support bead so that the concentration of the capture ligand is at or below the KD of the interaction between the target and the capture ligand. This ensures that the KD that we will measure for the test compound is independent of the identity and the potency of the capture ligand and target interaction. Fantastic. Thank you, Ksenia. Uh, so the next question from our audience now, is the customized assay development for new target proteins proprietary for the company or can it be transferred to the customer? Thank you. Um, so unfortunately, our assays are all run in-house and cannot be outsourced to the customers, uh, but we are happy to provide any details um, that they would like to ask about the assays. Great, thanks, Ksenia. Uh, so the next question from our audience, do you further or can you further optimize the individual hits to improve potency? Thank you. So yes, we do have chemistry services that we offer at Eurofins and we can discuss integrated projects where we involve the chemistry team to help work on improving the chemistry. So we, in San Diego, we would run the actual screen and provide the hits and the measurements. And then the chemistry um, team will work with the customer to further improve the chemistry. And we can for perform SAR screening campaigns on a weekly basis. So uh, the turnaround for these is very short, five days turnaround time. Great, thank you, Ksenia. Um, so are all of the tested ligases full length? Uh, most of them are full length. We always try to develop the assay using the full length uh, target. If for some reason the assay performs uh, in, to a less quality 
or sometimes if there are multiple domains that bind to the capture ligand, it can cause cooperativity and uh, a change in the binding reaction, which will not report the accurate KB. So in that case, we will use just separate domains that bind to the ligand, but most of them are full lengths and this information can, is provided on our website if you look at the individual assays. Thanks uh, for that, Ksenia, and uh, thank you for all the questions that have come through. We've had some absolutely excellent submissions today. Please remember you can still submit any questions you have uh, using the questions panel in the menu. Uh, so let's take a look at our next question now. So Ksenia, uh, will you develop an assay that is not in your current menu and terms? Yes, absolutely. We will consider any request for a new target that we don't commercially offer. We will look into the feasibility of assay development, so we would look whether um, we can use a small molecule to build the ligand or uh, whether we will use a peptide. Usually the cloning itself of the target is not an issue since um, we are using overexpressed protein and not purified protein, so the only limiting uh, figure would be the ligand, um, but we will look into the feasibility and offer further information to the customer on that. Great, thank you. Um, so do you have a strategy for developing ligands for E3s with no known substrates? And is there any drawback with the competition-based format compared to a traditional direct binding assay? Yeah, so we usually, so at first we went after the most uh, used and most popular E3 ligases in targeted protein degradation. Um, later, we decided to go uh, and look what other small molecule ligands are published or known. And after that, the strategy would go would be to go after E3 ligases that are, first of all, involved with the proteasome degradation system and also that there is enough uh, literature about what type of ligands they bind because this will provide us enough information to build ligands using peptides and not small molecules. So that would be the strategy. Thanks so much, that's great. Um, just a reminder, you can still submit any questions you have for Ksenia using, uh, to answer using the questions panel in the menu. Uh, so now let's take a look at the next question. So what is the turnaround time for custom assay development for E3 scan? Um, so it would be between four to six weeks, depending on the ligand that we will be using. So usually, to synthesize a small molecule bait takes a little bit longer than synthesizing a peptide bait. So that would depend on that. And the cloning is done in parallel to designing the bait. Um, but overall should take between four to six weeks to uh, get the reagents in house and start the development process and get the proof of concept and final assay optimization condition. Perfect. Thank you, Ksenia. Um, so I just want to ask if anyone has any more questions, please do send them in for us. Um, and our next question now is, uh, which strategy do you use for developing the ligands and or peptides? A very good question. So if it's a um, small molecule, we would look at um, what was published on the structure of the small molecule and use the known information to know uh, how it's labeled, how it can be labeled uh, for our purposes. If it's a peptide, we would build the peptide based on a known ligand of the E3 ligase. And then this ligand will be also uh, labeled with uh, the label that we use to immobilize on the beads. So, um, again, going after known published um, uh, papers and uh, literature research, this is what uh, really help us. And although some of the information is proprietary to us, but it's all based on published uh, literature studies. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Ksenia. Um, so I'm just going to wait now to see if any more of our audience have any questions that they'd like to send through. Uh, we've had some absolutely fantastic contributions today. So uh, if you've got anything that you'd like Ksenia to answer, please do send that through now. Okay, well, if uh, we haven't got any more questions that come through, uh, then please join me in thanking Ksenia for her time today and uh, for giving such an excellent presentation. As you leave the webinar, a survey will appear on your screen asking you to rate the webinar. Please take a moment to provide your feedback. If now is not a good time, the survey will be sent to you shortly via email. If you could complete it when you can, we'd greatly appreciate it. So now on behalf of Drug Target Review and Eurofins Discovery, I'd like to thank you all for attending today's webinar. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.